Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And Joel, you wanted me to start this episode out with a very bold statement. I did. I made this statement before we kicked on the cameras and the microphones. And you said, I want you to start this episode out with that bold statement. So here's my statement. I had to write it down because there's, I... There's a lot of setup here. This is a lot of setup. Uh, so here's the sentence. I, you wanted me to repeat it, so I wrote it down because usually I can only think of things once. If you're not into personal growth, you have a glass ceiling on your understanding of type. That's a bold statement. Well, you said it was a bold statement. I don't think it's bold, but you indicated that it was a bold statement. And uh, and I guess it could be interpreted as bold because the insinuation is that you only get so far understanding type on its own terms. Yeah. You have to, in order to truly understand the model, and I would say its application or all of the different elements of it, because we, we just talked about the difference in a recent podcast about the difference between a coloring book understanding of type and a Van Gogh understanding of type. And I think that when a person, or my observation is when a person doesn't give themselves the opportunity to, um, to put type on a timeline, understand how it changes with the person using these different t- tools, you know, these cognitive tools, uh, then you're going to have a truncated understanding of the system itself because you're going to be missing lots of pieces of information. So can I just immediately push back on this idea? Play yes, devil's advocate. That's what you do. Clearly, I agree with you because I'm recording this podcast with you and I am on your side, but I'm gonna play the <laughs> I'm gonna play the other devil's advocate side for just a moment. So we know based on interviews we've we've heard and we've seen information around the intelligence community here in the United States using Myers Briggs. It's their favorite typology system to type people. The intelligence community, you mean like the CIA? The CIA, mm-hmm. FBI, NSA. Yeah. Right. Like we know that that's their preferred tool. Yeah, for better or for worse. For psychometric, you know, profiling or typing other people. And what what I hear you saying then is because I'm sure the CIA is not using this in a personal growth framework, are you saying the, the CIA doesn't actually understand the system they're using in this really high level? against like criminals and spies and all of this is that is that what i can take from your statement i don't think they're using it at a high level i think they're using it at a bare bones level and i think that a person can understand the system for a wide variety of applications without being into personal development but if you are not also doing if you're not into personal growth there will be a cap at how much you can understand the system. So I'm just saying you're going to hit a glass ceiling. I'm not, I'm not saying that everything, all of the application and content and everything that lives underneath that glass ceiling is irrelevant. I yeah. think there's lots of information there and lots of magic and power and all sorts of great stuff that live in you know, that level of understanding type. I'm just saying if you're not into personal growth, you're going to hit an acme and you might not even understand that it's an acme. Yeah. Well, I guess from the CIA standpoint, that might be in its best interest because the more they would know about the system, maybe its usefulness might decline. Mm -hmm. Like maybe the the usefulness in is how uh, simple of a framework they're using. Mm -hmm. And so maybe what we're saying is somebody that comes with a lot of theory behind them, if that theory is not tied to personal growth frameworks of applying it to the self, that theory is probably not very good theory. But if the person was using it to, let's say, type somebody online or, you know, watching a video and determining their best fit type or something, or maybe even in profiling, like we teach in profiler training, growth doesn't need to be part of that because, and again, I'm kind of begging the question. I know where we're heading with this, so I'm, I'm teeing you up to answer it. <laughs> uh, so we're saying basically they don't need growth even for those things either. Well, sometimes a really complex concept of the type system like you said, goes against your intended use for it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, and I'm, it's not like a, I mean, uh, when I came out of the gate saying you said it was a bold statement, it probably sounds quite judgmental and I don't mean it in a judgmental way. I'm not saying that, um, again, I'm not saying that anything less than that is going to not be good. Uh, by the way, I said before, I used the wrong term. I said, um, you're going to hit an acme. I'm going to, I actually meant you're going to hit a synthetic acme, <laughs> but it's not going to be the acme, right? You're not going to hit the actual, you know, full understanding of type. And in some ways that's because it doesn't exist. That 
complete, full, 100% understanding of type in all arenas. It is a map of humans. And humans, we're not going to understand any human to its nth degree before we die. Yeah. And that includes ourselves. Uh, and I think it's because th it doesn't end, right? As we continue to live, there is more to understand because there are more experiences that are happening. And so type follows the trajectory of people. Yeah. It follows it follows that path. So there's no way to get to the acme of type understanding. Um, but you will hit something. You'll hear a little bunk, right? If you don't use it for personal growth, because you won't be able to track the development of people who are on that trajectory the ones who are continuing to go up you won't be able to see that and in neural well no it's um spiral dynamics they have a concept called the pre-trans fallacy which is if you've got three levels of development in something uh, a person is going to be incapable like the person who's at the middle level is going to be incapable of seeing the person who's at the higher level and so whatever characteristics that individual is showing up with they will attribute it to a lower level and so that happens as well in type and personal growth you know when a person continues to go up that trajectory an individual who has chosen to not walk that path might actually misinterpret things that they're seeing as being you know sort of more simple than they truly are so then what i what i see developing here is a distinction around using personality type systems and using per personality type systems for self-growth, for growth reasons. Because one could argue the CIA is using it, so their understanding of it would be good because they're ostensibly applying it in the real world. But, but we're saying that that still is not going to be enough. Like just, be, just by making it practical and actionable. Because I think that's where we used to think, like maybe many years ago. We've always been into personal growth. But it was like, well, put it in the application. Understand how it's used. Use it in coaching. Use it to help people. That's going to round out your understanding of the system. But we're saying, no, that's even more than that. It's not just helping other people or being able to interface or putting into action. It's also putting into action for the self. And this is where I think our, our coaching and work with John Beebe comes in where you know, for years we've talked about grow your co-pilot, grow your auxiliary cognitive function. You know, we talk about the car model. And it's like, what does that mean? I'll just grow it, go exercise it, whatever, use it. And we know archetypically that's a parent energy. But applying it to the self, self-parenting, is when it starts to really unlock. So it's not just applying it in the outer world, it's applying it in a particular way to the self in growth. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's what we're talking about today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, there's, this is important, I think, to some extent because, and I know that not everybody uses type in a personal growth, you know, like that's not their application. And that's fine. I don't think everybody should. I, I actually think that personal growth is one of those things that it's really easy to, if you're a, if you're an individual that is into growth and development, it's really easy to start patting yourself on the back for it and yeah. acting like it's, you know, it's sort of ethically superior to be an individual into growth and development. Um, and there's a lot of ego stroking that happens in this world. And I mean, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I just think it's an interest. Yeah. I think it's something that you get bitten by a bug, right? And usually you get bitten by a bug around personal growth and development because you had to, because you were in a situation that you just couldn't solve it on your own. And you sought tools to help you solve the problem. You found tools. They happen to be tools related to growth and development. And then you go, oh, this is a thing. And then now you're off to the races. Yeah. And some people get a little into personal growth, just kind of like, I always think of it as like working out at the gym. Some people get a little bit into working out because you know, they want to, I don't know, they, they want to keep themselves healthy or they want to continue to have stamina, you know, for their kids or, or whatever. Like it's kind of yeah. a casual relationship. And then there are people who are gym rats who are in there like hours a day and the gym is available for both kinds. And it's also waiting for people who haven't yet hit the gym, right? It's just going to be there for them. So if a person hits the gym, there are lots of benefits to it. Uh, but are those people like ethically or morally superior people or are they people who just have realized that there's an advantage to going to the gym right well, and so i think growth is a little bit like that well how i see it sorry to cut you off how i see it is the gym wasn't needed two hundred thousand years ago our ancestors didn't need a gym because the biological pressure was already there by the circumstances life circumstances they were born into so you didn't have to go to a gym when you're a tribe on the serengeti in africa Right. right. Our ancestors that we came from, like they had to hunt and fish and forage for food and eventually farm and all the things they had to do. 
that kept them physically strong. Right, make ropes. And the and the weakest <laughs> the weakest would die off and the strongest would survive. And so there was all this like system running that just made it happen. And I almost see personal growth in a very similar way. It's it's just as synthetic as the gym in that a lot of personal growth is fighting against the ease of life. Like the reason we need personal growth is because our world is set up, technology is set up, society and culture is set up to keep letting us off the hook. It keeps letting us escape from the natural biological pressure and imperatives that we would have and gives us a bunch of options to not do those things, whether it's cultural, societal, relational, whatever. Like we don't have any of those things that are putting that pressure on naturally. So it's a decision. When we go into personal growth, what we're saying is I'm deciding to purposely put tension into my life, almost like resistance training in the gym. I'm going to put resistance into my life to grow an area of myself that won't naturally be grown in the, in the system that's set up. And I, I think that's the, it's not really a noble pursuit. It's just, it's, that's a decision somebody makes to put themselves in that path, to put mm -hmm. tension on themselves where maybe 200,000 years ago, again, in a tribe, personal growth probably just naturally happened for its circumstances in the moment. But mm. we live a very synthetic, abstract, disconnected from our original biology life. So we have to be mindful and intentional about drawing those kinds of things in that create that tension that will make us better people. Yeah, I 100% agree with what you just said. I think that that's pretty brilliant actually i would quibble a little this is a quibble this sure. is an introverted thinking accuracy quibble let's get down to the the details yeah. no it's just i would actually say it's a noble pursuit i just don't think it's morally superior that's what i meant yeah that's a good <laughs> yeah. distinction yeah i mean yes yeah. yeah i think it's a noble pursuit in the same way that working out is a noble noble pursuit i think good things come from it i just don't think that the person is like a superior human being for choosing it yeah and a lot of times it's because we ch the people who are into those kinds of things chose it for all sorts of things that they had no control over honestly like um my observation has been that the people who quote unquote live in the gym usually have looking at through the lens of type have higher access to extroverted sensing or sensation than i do hmm. i'm just not going to live at the gym it just does not it does not give me the immediate real world rewards now i know some people who are np types ntp types like myself who are who have just like sort of perfected this entire gym thing but they don't live at the gym they they figured it out in other ways. They gamed it. Yeah. And um and so I think quote unquote living at the gym is it, it's because that's high reward. So is is that person superior ethically, morally superior because they're pre wired to enjoy that kind of experience? I don't think so. But is it a noble pursuit for sure? And anybody who go who puts their foot in a gym and works out and fights against the synthetic reality around us that encourages us to make all sorts of choices that are not healthy to our bodies. Um, though that's a noble pursuit, whether you're just like walking in and going like, okay, that's all I could do for the day. Or you are there for two hours. I think it's noble. And I think the same thing with personal growth. You just mentioned that we live in a, a world that kind of lets us off the hook a lot. And I would say to add to that, a big piece is that it also keeps us from having any sort of quiet time. Yeah. Like our ancestors, for basically all of human history had much quieter environments than we do. Even the ones who lived in the city, like there were moments when it was just silence and they were alone with their thoughts and they couldn't grab something to entertain themselves with the backlight and they couldn't grab earbuds. They couldn't grab anything and candles were expensive. And so they couldn't read to entertain themselves. So if they were awake, they were alone with their thoughts and we do not have that luxury anymore. I mean, we, we, rob us, we rob ourselves of the luxury of silence. And a lot of inner work is done in silence. Hmm. So I think that's a big thing. And so um, I think you're right. I think people who are into personal growth are pushing against the more synthetic experience we have than our ancestors to, in some ways, get the same gain. Yeah. yeah. And how can we define personal growth? I'm, I'm realizing as I'm thinking about this, how I define it for myself is any attempt of the individual, I'll just use myself, any attempt of me to make a change about who I am or how I show up to get a different result that I want instead of the one I don't want, to me is kind of the basic definition of personal growth. Mm. So somebody that's that isn't quote unquote into personal growth, how you would maybe define it, or I would define it. 
but they're like they they learn a way to greet their partner at the door when they come in home from work every day and they change that behavior i consider that a step of personal growth mm -hmm. now it's not they're made not into personal growth but just like i would say exercise is getting up off the couch and walking around your house or outside for a, a short walk all the way up to lifting heavy weights every day in the gym both are getting exercise and pushing your body and and stretching and moving your your energy around so when we say personal growth is there a threshold to this is there an absolute to this like what do we mean by that mm -hmm. that's a great question um so i'm jotting down really quickly what i think is a couple different key indicators because yeah. um i didn't come in going i'm gonna have to define personal growth of course well i just i would yeah. ask you just to define it for yourself i mean we don't have to give a formal definition yeah I think this is an exploratory topic in some ways yeah and i love that you asked it uh so I think what I would just off the top of my head say is my personal defin definition of, of growth and development is when you consciously make choices to improve yourself or the systems around you to yeah. have a better result. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how big or little that is. Uh, but when you, you also have to think about it in a long term, you have to kind of see it as a long game. Because when you start making these choices and changes, consciously making changes in your life to improve or in yourself to improve yourself or your, your, the systems around you, um, a lot of times things get worse first and it takes a while to actually see the return. So growth isn't a quick fix. It is a long-term systemic fix. Like it's an attempt to make long-term systemic changes so that you will eventually, eventually improve your life. So with that in mind, again, this goes back to the removal of the ethics or the morality from it, because I would argue that there have been many dictators around the world who changed themselves and the system around them to get a different emergent that I would disagree with the reasons they did that. I would mm -hmm. say that's an immoral or unethical thing to do. Mm -hmm. And yet they were in a framework of personal growth. They were growing themselves, their capacities, their abilities, and they were changing the system to the one they wanted. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with how they did it. I don't agree with what they wanted from it all. But with that definition, that working definition, that's it reinforces the fact that you can remove the ethics from it. There's nothing that makes you superior to be into personal growth. In fact, you may be a dictator or an assassin that wants to hurt people and you want to continue to improve your capacity in those ways. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So so that's something to take into consideration. There's no absolute morality to this at all. Yeah. I think most people who are into growth and development usually find their way to emotional intelligence of some kind. And so most of the time most of the time it turns into a flavor of, of something of that isn't I, evil. I know I'm 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 really going down yeah. into this. I get it. I get it. I'm no. pushing back. But well, you, you know, get you're, the point. You're creating distinctions and I think that's yeah. important. Um so uh I think the other thing is that as far as I'm concerned, the end game on personal growth and development is that it accelerates maturity. Mm. So maybe that's an even better personal definition. Is anything that accelerates maturity? And I don't have a definition for maturity, so I hope that's okay. But if you think about it in terms of, you know, levels of development based on ages, as we age, there is an expectation for us to be at a certain level of maturity at a certain age. If we're acting like a five-year-old when we're five, that's fine. If we're acting like a five-year-old when we're 10, that's not okay. Even though it's only a five-year difference, it's definitely not okay. If we're acting like a five-year-old when we're 15, something's probably wrong. Yeah. And so what personal growth does is it makes sure first, and I think that this is why um, people get bitten by a bug when they have challenges and hard times. And, and we can even maybe at some point in the future do a podcast on like levels of aging maturity and how that, that actually also impacts type. Yeah. is like how we develop through our, our time. But Eric Erickson, who um, was a psychiatrist who um, I think was a psychiatrist, definitely at least a psychologist who studied children's development. And in my opinion, a total genius uh, saw that each developmental level was effectively a complete and total ego change. And it was a response to a bunch of challenges that the child could not solve at their current level. And so they basically had to completely reform who and what they were at each of these developmental levels. And so Oftentimes, when those of us who get into growth and development do something similar when we're older, it's because we 
probably missed something mm. in our in our maturity, in our maturation. We missed something. And it caused major problems later that forced us to do something similar, which is like completely reevaluate our ego and be willing to alter it and change it, change it up for something that was mature enough to deal with the situation at hand. Yeah. And most people who are just a little bit into growth and development, they they just need a little of that. But I think when people get super into growth and development, uh, they start liking it. They start getting access to levels of maturity that are sort of beyond their years. And I think this can loop back into why it's imperative to understand type. But at a certain point, I mean, one of the challenges to be being super into personal growth is that a lot of people complain that it's really lonely, right? And why is it lonely? Well, it's, it's lonely in, in some ways because it's hard to hang out with people who aren't your peer group. You know, yeah. like it's it's nice to hang out with children and it's nice to hang out with people who are older and that's really great. But there's just something about hanging out with people around your own age, right? They're peers. You, they kind of get where you're at. You get too far into growth and development, you, you, you're, it's harder to find peers, people who have gone down this road with you. And so one of the disadvantages is that it can be a lonely path. And that usually only happens to people who got bit by the bug, <laughs> because why yeah. would you do it? Why would you keep doing it if it doesn't have constant and perpetual rewards? So you get bit by this bug and you want all of those levels of maturity. If a person isn't to write it back to the very beginning, when I said that if you're not into personal growth, you're going to hit a glass ceiling of understanding type is everybody who is into growth and development at this level, who is maturing, maybe even beyond where the over overwhelming majority of humans mature by the time they hit their 70s or 80s if you just keep maturing then if you're not a person who understands how that path works you might not be able to see people who are at higher levels of maturation than what you're expecting to see and so you might not know what you're seeing because type follows them there hmm. type is like type helps us understand the tools of cognition that we're using but our access to tools it almost seems like the tools themselves become better when the user becomes better right yeah. like it's like a, a baton in the hands of somebody who's just learning how to twirl a baton is a completely different thing than somebody who has become one of those fire dancers yeah right it almost looks like the tool improved it turned took on a whole different life but it, it's just the relationship between the skilled user and the tool and so the reason why you'll hit a almost like this glass ceiling of understanding type is that you might not recognize that this tool is the same tool as it was being used at lower levels of maturity in the hands of somebody who is now at this really high level of maturity and and it's like a whole different enchilada for them okay. and so if you want to understand the system at its you know like like if you want to understand all of the access to the system you have to be somebody who understands how this personal growth process works and how the tools alter and change based on where we're at so let me use, first of all, let me state, I think what you're saying, and then probably give an example that's actually not a Myers-Briggs example, because I think that actually be under, that'll be easier for us to understand, I think. So what I hear you saying, just to reiterate, is that the behaviors that I see in somebody, let's just pick an age, like 20, the behaviors I see at somebody at 20 might look similar to behaviors of somebody that is at 80 years old. But because I may not be factoring in, if I'm not a personal growth person and tuned into how maturation works, because that's how we're defining personal growth, if I'm not tuned into that, I might conflate and say, well, that 80-year-old is the same personality type as the 20-year-old because they're doing the same behaviors. And I think what your argument is, well, maturation, attunement to maturation, having gone through it myself and always being focused on what does maturation look like? What does personal growth look like? I'm able to look at the 80-year-old person and say, they've been through some stuff. They've had to figure some things out. So we may not be able to assume that they're doing those behaviors for the same reasons as that 20-year-old. That 20-year-old might be doing them for very um, uh, lower level reasons or more basic reasons. They haven't matured as much. They haven't seen as much stuff in life. And so that 80-year-old, we have to account for the life they've been through as we're looking at their cognition, as we're examining their personality type, as we're understanding them as a person, and not just their type, but their whole, the whole person. There's a bunch of things that they've probably been through that have had to calibrate and they've had to figure out and that's going to make them show up different. Even if they're the same personality type, maybe they're exhibiting completely different behaviors, but they're the same on paper personality type as the 20-year-old. 
but they look so different. So they can't be that type because that 20 year old's looking like this. So you can't be the same type as a 20 year old. Right. And so that maturation process, really tuning into it helps us understand how people go through life and how they might exhibit different qualities and characteristics because you're certainly not going to be the same person at 20 and is at 80. Like you're going to be different whether you've been in personal growth or not. Your life experience will change you. Right. Yeah. Life itself seasons and matures us. Yeah. And so understanding development it helps us understand how type is different on that developmental line, that timeline of life, regardless of whether or not growth is in there. Yeah. You add the component of growth, which is accelerated maturity, and now it throws all of the instruments off. So let's use the Enneagram as a good example here. The Enneagram is set up the way we understand it, the way we teach it, and the way our colleagues Beatrice and Aranio talk about it is, I'm, a, I'm an Enneagram social six, for example, and they say, that's not what you are. And so at my, when I'm first learning the Enneagram as a social six, I start to over-identify with the social six and all the characteristics of the fear and the push-pull with authority and all the things that a social six, quote unquote, has a personality type around. But if I'm on my maturation and personal growth path, the social six is exactly what I'm not. In fact, a six in the Enneagram is the most courageous type. It's right in the middle of the fear triad. But yet, in a maturation experience, I am the most courageous of all the Enneagram types, supposedly, right? I mean, sure, there's other courageous types, but you get the point. I'm, I'm oversimplifying this for the sake of argument. So to look at me and say, oh, you can't be a six if I'm in my like 70s or 80s because you don't have fear and you don't have a push-pull relationship with authority. And how could you possibly be a six? Look how courageous you are. Well, no, that actually proves the point. Like, in understanding my type, I've worked on myself to get to the place where that doesn't define me anymore, which is the whole point of using a system like the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is what we're saying. There's a corollary here to the Myers-Briggs system as well. Now, it's a little bit harder, I think, to see inside the Myers-Briggs system because it's not set up in the same framework as the Enneagram. That's why I use the Enneagram as an example. Mm -hmm. But there's something almost, almost not identical, but very similar happening in the Myers-Briggs system that's happening in the Enneagram system is... If I'm a maturing ENFP, over time, I'm going to look less like a quote unquote stereotypical ENFP because I'm balancing myself out. I'm rounding out my personality. I'm overcoming some of my one-sidedness. I'm becoming a whole person. I'm individuating and I'm becoming complete over the cycle of my life if I'm attuned to growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're also sort of killing and rebirthing your ego over and over. Yeah. And so there's... There are characteristics that come through that are experiential in that growth phase that if you haven't experienced them, it's hard to understand how much impact they have on um, how a person's going to show up. So it's not that if you are not into personal growth, your understanding, your theoretical understanding of type is going to be inaccurate. It's just it's going to have a glass ceiling. It's just not, it's not going to be able to touch on people who have gone through these accelerated maturation processes and come out the other side, a bunch of question marks, right? I, I have such a hard time finding this person's type. We also, we, we talk about it in a bell curve. People who have done uh, a lot of personal growth work are very difficult to profile and people who are very unhealthy versions of their type, One sometimes- sided. Yeah, yeah uh, sometimes they're easy to figure out just because they're so stereotypical. But if they're really unhealthy, that throws off the instruments too. Yeah. So if you want to be able to understand the edges of the bell curve, then you have to understand how growth and development works in a more experiential way. Because it is, again, hard to understand how much that influences. So I think looking at the person who's like 20 and 80 to bring it down to a type, you know, to Myers-Briggs type concepts, you know, it's very rare for like, let's take, for example, um, somebody with INTJ preferences. It's very rare with some, for somebody with INTJ preferences to be super chatty when they're in their teens. Now they might've been chatty as a little kid, right? As their the earliest part of their ego is forming. But by the time they get to, I don't know, like around puberty, there there are there are INTJs that are chatty, but it's it's pretty rare. But it's way more common for older people who have INTJ preferences to be chatty because they've gone through a lot of stuff that taught them the value of it, the value of offering and the value of communicating and 
They might have had a career that required it. And, you know, it's like they're, they're going to be a little bit more offering because, you know, they're not so worried about, you know, in puberty, you're totally worried about this idea of mating, right? <laughs> and like, who's going to want me? And you're so, so plugged into everybody else's approval in order to be part of the, you know, sort of the marketplace. But by the time you're like in your 50s, 60s, 70s, that's, that's not a, I mean, you still want to be attractive. And, and if you're single, you still want to attract a mate, but it's, it's not your all consuming thought. Yeah. And who's, you're, you're tapped into your own sense of approval at that point. So you're actually trying to self approve. And therefore, you're going to have learned a lot of mechanisms, most likely, to not be so withdrawn. You're going to have a little bit more of an openness and a chattiness. So if you're talking to somebody who's in their 70s and they figured out the value of being chatty, and so you're talking to a chatty person, and they say, I have INTJ preferences, and you're like, no, you don't, because INTJs are super quiet. It's like, <laughs> you're talking to somebody with seven decades of life experience. Yeah, It's not going to show up like... The meme, all right? It's not going to show up in a cartoonized way. It's going to show up in a more seasoned, mature, you know, developed expression. And so growth, again, it accelerates maturity. So it brings some of those those characteristics a little sooner, a little earlier in the process. And an understanding of the life cycle of a type or the life cycle of type in and of itself and how it develops that will give you an insight into how personal growth might sort of bring in um, the, uh, the, the, the op- what is the opposite of dilate? <laughs> it's like that brings sort of in. Contract. Yeah, or- exactly. That life cycle. Um, a person who is in their 40s or 50s who is really dedicated to growth and development might have some of those qualities and characteristics that normally would only be reserved for them in much later time periods. Yeah. They might be tapped into that. And so uh, so that's why I made the statement that if you're not into personal growth, if you don't understand how it works, then you're going to be missing some components of type theory. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. I think it would probably also be a good time to inject that a lot of people mistake illumination or awareness for growth. So that's kind of why I wanted to define growth is because it's it's there's one thing to just be aware of something or illuminate it. Like, oh, now I know how this works. That's different than oh, now I know how this works and I'm going to start to create behavior change in myself to adjust and accommodate something I want to be different in my life. Those, and that's a little harder work than just being illuminated, but it's so easy in our modern world when you can Google anything, you can get awareness quickly and information quickly. It it kind of goes to that DIKW model, Mm -hmm. right? Data, information, knowledge, wisdom. Um, it's so easy to get data and information in our world, we conflate that for knowledge and wisdom. And I think the same thing here, illumination and awareness, sometimes we have a false read for ourselves and we go, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm into personal growth when really what we're into is illumination. We're really into understanding and awareness, not into application in a growth frame. Yeah, insight, right? Illumination is that moment you're like, oh, I totally know yeah. how this works and you get an insight. That is a totally different ball of wax from doing something about it Mm -hmm. and implementing changes in your life to accommodate this new insight. Well, and in fact, yeah, so this is something, okay, let me talk about a real world scenario. I have insight that I tend to get excited when conversations are happening and I jump in with a new idea and I cut people off. I have awareness and insight about that. That's not personal growth. I mean, that's a step in the right direction to be aware of that but I need to stop cutting people off with my excitable ideas and let them finish their sentence before I jump in with my idea. Like that's the growth that I have to take. That's what I have to do. But what I see a lot of people doing in type is going, well, I'm an ENFP. I could see myself even doing this. Well, I'm an ENFP. I get excited about, I've used this excuse as well. I get excited about things. So of course I'm going to cut you off because it's actually me being very interested in what you have to say. And I, 
I'm meeting you halfway. And it's like, I use the type system to actually cover the fact I'm not doing growth around this and excusing it based on the awareness I had that, well, that's what I do, right? I cut people off because I'm an ENFP and I can't wait to just jump in the conversation and contribute. Well, that's not actually personal growth. That's in fact an escape valve or a bypass around something that I could actually address that would actually help people in my life experience me better. I think you know what I'm talking about, Antonio. <laughs> uh, rather than just jumping in all the time. Yeah. And that's hard work and I'm still working on it. Like it's still tough for me. No matter how hard I put attention to it, my extrovert intuition exploration just kicks in and I just, I keep wanting to jump in with things. Yeah. People who only know us from the podcast will be like, yes, but Antonia never stops talking. So of course you have to jump in. Well, and that's true. <laughs> and it, not just on the podcast. <laughs> oh, you're not going to pretend like I do more talking off the podcast. You, you do a lot of talking, not all of the talking, but yeah, you, you, uh, all right, I'm going to do an audit of everybody who knows us. And I'm going to ask who does more talking off the podcast. You really want to do that. I'm Cheer, interested. Cheers to that. All right. I'm I, I'll, I'll be curious yeah, to see what let's comes find back out. <laughs> without, we've got to ask them before this episode comes out. Cause they might, they might know something's up, but yeah. yeah All right. Good. All right. I'll find out. All right. Information pending. So regardless, <laughs> uh, Yes. Uh, remember, challenges don't work out well for you when you challenge me on these things. Remember when we first met and you challenged me? You you thought that uh, you were able to embarrass me in public more than I can embarrass you. Oh, but that was just complete and total ignorance on and my part. I was part. like, I don't know about that. No, that was just that was the the salad days of youth, right? Those were You're the <laughs> that was before I understood the full capacity of people with ENFP preferences and you specifically, your capacity to hang with social embarrassment. It's it's not I, I've never seen the like. So I just didn't know. That was like the first day we met or the second day we met. I just could not have known. Right. So you can't hold me that to All that right. one. Fair enough. <laughs> now I have like over a decade of understanding and knowledge about the two of us. I think I have a little more <laughs> leg to stand on with that one. Fair enough. Well, and I was gonna go back to what you mentioned, which was this idea of like using having ENFP preferences to justify the behavior. And then I was thinking you know, based on what we're talking about right now is an understanding of type theory in general. The next level of that um, is, and you can't be an ENFP if you don't do that. Yeah. Right. If somebody actually has taken the time and develop, you know, developed themselves and worked on themselves and handled some of those very, you know, I do this because I'm an ENFP and like, oh, that's the, that's the golden ticket. That's the golden t ticket to be able to just behave however I want to. And if somebody's done the hard work of getting to the other side of that, it's like, oh, that person can't be an ENFP. They're mistyped. Yeah. It's like, well, you're not honoring all the work they did, right? And I think that's the other piece of it is when somebody has a lot of, they've done a lot of growth and development, particularly understanding type as a tool and having that be part of their personal growth, to say that they're they're not that type completely dishonors all the work they put into it to be able to, you know, to, to sort of soften those rough edges. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, you can't be an ENTP. Why can't I be an ENTP? And that's people serving the system. Yes. That's having people have to fit a system rather than having the system emerge from the person. That's right. That's and, right. And we see it all the time. You know, we we spend a lot of time in our profile training program going through these kinds of things because that's, I think all of us do this. Yeah. doesn't matter how long we've been at this. We all tend to do these kinds of things. Yeah. And so I think it also requires a, a better foundational understanding of what type is all about. Is it 16 boxes that we kind of shove ourselves into? And that would be sort of the, the highest level of like just understanding 16 personalities, right? And we all shove ourselves in there. And if that's the case, if that's as far as it goes, well, then all of the detractors have a point, right? Yeah. All the people who write those articles about how terrible Myers-Briggs is because that's their level of understanding and they don't want to be shoved into a box. If that's where we're at, if we're serving a system, then we've just proven all those people right. Or we get one layer down where we're looking at it in terms of, you know, dichotomy level, introversion, extroversion, sensing intuition. But if we have to obey this master, right, of like, I'm a thinker, so therefore emotions are icky. I mean, we can make jokes about it, you know. I mean, truly, like when I'm in a really deeply emotional place, it's not comfortable. I'm not happy there. It is kind of yucky. And that's my work. My work is to hang there and to get better at being in that space and not go, well, I'm a thinker, so I'm not supposed to do this. <laughs> and so if we're doing that, again, we're, we are obeying a system. We're not using it to its full capacity. And then when we get to function level, which makes us all feel so, so smart and special, 
right? Those of us who are into type and understand functions and they're like, this is how this is how this function works. And I'm super smart because I figured this out. Again, we fall for this serving the function, mm. right? Like the function is a tool that gives us as people insights. You may, recently made a tweet about how introverted feeling understands people's intentions and motivations. And then there was some and that's the function that we nickname authenticity. And there was some like hubbub about like, no introverted feeling is just about the self. And I'm like, okay, the function might be, but you're not trapped in introverted feeling or authenticity, even if you have ENFP preferences. You get to kick some of that content up to the thinking brain and the brain goes, well, now that I'm tapped into this idea of intentions and motivations, where else are intentions and motivations? Oh yeah. yes, around me, right? And other people, well, I'm pretty tapped into that energy. so. When I see somebody behaving in a certain way, my introverted feeling is going to have the sophistication because it's been studying this thing inside of me for so long. It's going to be able to go, I think that that's probably what's going on for the other person. Yeah. Right? And how would it not? It's a parent function for you. How would it not be aware of what's going on for others? It's like, no, it's just a subjective experience. It's just for you as an individual. And I'm like, how does that make any sense? It follows me. I don't follow it. I'm not trapped by it. So this idea that we have to serve any aspect of this system that it doesn't serve us that's also a challenge of not being into growth because once you get into growth and you use the system in personal growth you start to realize it's not the tool for all the problems it is not the complete package of who i am i do not serve this system i am not going to be shoved into these descriptions or these memes or these descriptions i am me and there is a lot to me that has nothing to do with that but when i know this oh my gosh it makes it so much easier so I feel pretty good about laying down the framework and having an open conversation about unpacking all these concepts and ideas. Let's see if we can find, for you listening right now, let's find a through line for how you apply this. What is, what's the point of this? How can you take this and use it in your life? Hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think, I mean, I made a statement and then I just spent probably approximately 45 minutes saying why I was right in my statement. <laughs> so... Uh, I don't know if I really said anything that was particularly applicable, but I do think that this idea of um, levels of development as humans is a big part of understanding type development, understanding the, the how a person matures. And referencing back to Eric Erickson, this idea of you know sort of the ego breaking, ego breaking down and rebuilding itself. We're going to be using the same set of cognitive preferences to do that, you know, sort of phoenix rising from the ashes of its own you know yeah. flames over and over and over throughout our life and every time we go through one of those cycles our relationship to our functions are going to change and more is going to be available to us and we're going to be more seasoned and we're going to understand things a little bit more so i think maybe what could be beneficial is a conversation about what are those levels of development just in general as humans and then maybe weave in a little concept of type theory in there to go well and what can we expect and then what does it look like when we are at extended levels of maturity, Yeah. right? Like midlife and beyond, which is midlife is something that Carl Jung talked about a lot. In fact, he's one of the, he's one of the few people who's ever talked about it, honestly. There's still not a lot of research done around midlife. But in his opinion, midlife is yet another almost massive rebirth that happens. And we have some choices that pr are presented at midlife that totally alter the, the, the rest of how many ever decades we get after that. It totally alters things. So um, maybe we should can kick to like the next episode. I definitely think we okay. should <laughs> wrap this one up and then pick up in the next episode yeah. for time's sake. And uh, yeah, is that what you want to say then? To Yeah, well, out? and you were asking what is the practical? And I would say the practical is, well, first of all, might I encourage everyone to dip their toe in personal growth if they already haven't? I think most of our listeners are already into personal growth and development. That's mm. That's our niche, and that's usually the people who follow our content. And I would say that anybody who is at the center of that Venn diagram of growth and development and also type information or like being into the type system, just understand that it's natural and normal for your relationship to your type to change over time. Yeah, It's natural and normal for you to look less like the overarching descriptions. If you don't match like the little icons or the little pictures or the memes you see on Instagram around your type. Uh, if you did it anytime, that's a good sign because it means you probably do identify with that best fit, best fit type. But just in terms of development, you are actually supposed to change and alter. Yeah. You're supposed to understand more about where you're, you know, how you can use these tools. 
and use them with more dexterity and be a little less one-sided and sort of absolutely the perf- picture perfect of whatever your best fit type is. There is some, there's supposed to be some relaxing to it. Yeah. And, uh, and when you look at other people, just understand that they're also on a journey. Uh, they're on a timeline. Whether in, they're into growth and development or not, they are also on a timeline of development just because life does that to us. And that's also going to alter their, um, you know, their relationship to their type as well. So with that in mind, then, most of the people that are online creating and distributing the memes around personality types that we see, most of them are still in the process of finding themselves. Those people are in the midst. And so it's some of it's oversimplified. It's a meme level. It's at a very accessible level because the people that are creating it and distributing it and reading it, engaging with it, especially if they're young, are in the process of discovering and finding themselves. Mm. And what we're saying is there's also an opportunity to engage with type in having found yourself or in further down the road of finding yourself. Because we're always finding ourselves. We're always finding more about ourselves. Yeah. But further in that process. So there's more fidelity. There's more nuance. There's more complexity to it. It's not so simple. And I mean, we're teaching right now. We're both teaching our 10-year-old daughter personality types. I have to really oversimplify it for Piper to understand it right now. Now, not because she's dumb, not because she won't be self-aware, not because she won't get the complexities, but because she's starting at a certain point of maturity. And so I have to meet her where she's at. And I kind of talk about it in meme level. It's very broad brush. I'm not into cognitive functions at all right now when we're talking with her. We're just at the dichotomies, basic things like introversion, extroversion. Even I'm I'm oversimplifying things like sensing and intuition. I'm, I'm really broad brushing them right now just to give her access as she's finding herself, as she's attuning to this. As she gets more mature and understands more, I'll go deeper and hopefully those complexities will unlock for her as she, I'm sure they will, in her life as she matures. Mm. And so just understand that also, I think if you're somebody that's watching or listening to us and you're like, well, I'm so confused. There's so much content online that seems to contradict itself. Maybe look at where it's coming from. Is this somebody that's creating this that's still in the process of finding themselves? Are they somebody that's wise and has been using this in a application way, like a CI agent? They probably have a little more access to the system than... You know, somebody that just first knows about it. Uh, but then there's all this this growth frame. Somebody that really understands like, oh, okay, this isn't just about who I am and how I show up. It's also about taking deliberate actions in my life to mm-hmm. change things, change behavior, change circumstances to get the outcomes I want or to change something about me. Yeah, that's so interesting too because I actually, <laughs> I found that when somebody sends me content and they go, well, this this piece of content about, let, let's say they're describing some cognitive function. Let's pretend that they're describing extroverted thinking or effectiveness. And they'll be like, well, this, you know, this person says it's this way and then they'll send me another piece of content and this person's saying it's this way, so which one is it? And it's not uncommon for me to go, well, it's actually... It's actually both, but they're just looking at different aspects of the function. Like, yeah. and they're they're probably representing the aspect of the function that they personally experience or witness, or you know, this is the part of themselves that they're exploring right now. Like, the the world and realm of extroverted thinking or effectiveness is vast. <laughs> There's a lot to it because it is focused on an element of reality that has a lot to it right it's about building and progress and making things happen in the outside world and setting goals and managing resource and like timelines timelines and logistics i mean there's you know and making sure that everybody's on board in order to get all these things accomplished there's so much to that function if somebody's like mostly focused on marking things off of a task list and another person is focused on the leadership aspect and another person is focused on like sort of gathering tricks together to get things accomplished it's like they're all talking about it they're not they're not saying they're not contradicting each other they're looking at a different aspect of it and so um, that's the other thing is that when you're when you're looking at type content understand that the person might not be inaccurate they're just not complete and that there's more to it yeah and so try to get a complete concept of these types by you know by reading a little bit here and there and then going well what would be something that directly contradicts and, uh, and, and oftentimes it doesn't, oftentimes it's just, it's just a little piece of a much bigger puzzle. Yeah. So what do you think? What's coming up for you? You've been the third person here in this conversation. You haven't had a microphone. You're not here in the studio with us, but we still want to hear from you. So come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode, leave a comment, ask a question. More importantly, share your story. We want to hear from you. What's going on in your life? 
What's been your maturation process? Have you been attuned to personal growth and that's really unlocked personality type for you? Or are you like, you guys are full of crap. <laughs> I tried to go down the road of personal growth and it actually screwed up my understanding of type. And when I just stayed with a theory, I understand it way better than anybody else. And I'm awesome at it. Whatever it is. I don't know what your story is. Whatever that story might be, come and make your voice heard at personalityhacker.com. That's probably true too, because my experience with personal development and growth is that it always makes everything worse at first. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's the big challenge to get into growth and development is you, like you got to get through that initial like this is destroying my life. This is destroying everything. This is destroying my understanding of the world and reality. You got to get to the other side where all of a sudden you're like, "Oh, okay, now I understand." <laughs> but man, that initial is rough. So, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody said something to that effect, you know, getting into growth and development really ruined my understanding of type. I'm like, "I'm sure it did." <laughs> But you got to keep going. And on the other side, you'll go, oh, now I understand how it all works. And with that said, if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave a rating and review for us on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. We have a video podcast. It's on YouTube. It's called Personality Hacker. It's on our channel. And if you would like, subscribe, leave a comment there if that's where you're watching it from. That would also be awesome. That would help us out a lot. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. And if you leave us a rating and a review on Amazon or in Goodreads, again, this helps us. All these things help. Uh, and if we have a suite of personal growth-oriented programs through the lens of type at our website. It's personalityhacker.com. You can go to the, um, the homepage and find our course catalog. In the catalog will be quite a few programs and offerings around this concept of growth and development through the lens of type. The number one thing I would recommend you go check, check out is what we call an owner's manual. It's actually uh, an owner's manual for you as an individual, but it addresses your best fit type. So let's take, for example, the ISFJ owner's manual. It is your owner's manual for you to help understand who you are as a person, as an individual, but then there's all this stuff to understand about how you're pre-wired as well. So go check out the owner's manual. And, uh, and my recommendation is to go through all that content, look at the toolbox, and really start to do the growth and the um, application of type so that you get this more nuanced, non-coloring book level understanding and awareness of type because that's where the money is, right? That's where the gold is. So head over to personalityhacker.com and go find the program that's right for you. Yeah. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.